This message is entitled Being in Covenant. Now the question, what does it mean to be in covenant with Yahuwah? He states in Psalm 89.34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. In Exodus 19.5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my what? My covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people. Please note, I use in two names of our Creator, our Heavenly Father, as there is power in His name. God and Lord are titles, and is not His name. Yahuwah is our Heavenly Father. Jesus has no meaning. Yahusha means Yah is our salvation. Elohim means Mighty One or Mighty Ones. The real name of our Heavenly Father is Yahuwah. Spelled in English, Y-H-V-H, and then Hebrew, yod heh vav -He. In Paleo Hebrew, the original Hebrew language, and that Bible translator admit to removing his name over 7,000 times from our Bibles and replace it with the title Lord in capital letters, L-O-R-D, and God, which is being used for every false god or idol. And one need to ask himself the question, why? Question number one, what is the foundation of being in covenant and having an intimate relationship with Yahuwah? You can have all the knowledge of the scriptures, but if you don't have love for others, you are like an empty vessel deceiving yourself. In Galatians 5.14 it says, For the whole Torah is fulfilled in one word, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke 10.27, Yahusha said, You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, and with all your being, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Your actions, how you live your life, how you speak and treat others, will show whether you are truly in covenant Torah. In 1 John 3.18, it states, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In Romans 15.2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. 1 Peter 2.8, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Galatians 6.10 So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Without patience, kindness, and good works toward others, you are only deceiving yourself. If you think you are better than others, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. James 4.11 Brothers, do not speak against one another. He that speaks against a brother and judges his brother speaks against Torah and judges Torah. And if you judge Torah, you are not a doer of Torah, but a judge. Question number two, why is it important to be in covenant with Yahuwah? 
In Exodus 19, 5 and 6, we read, Now if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession. Out of all the nations for the whole earth is mine. And unto me you shall be a kingdom of priests and a set-apart nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. Revelation 5.10 He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his Elohim and Father, and we shall reign upon the earth. Then another translation says, And has made us unto our Elohim kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. First Peter 2 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set apart nation, a people for Yahuwah's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Second Peter or First Peter 2 5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yahusha, Messiah. From these scriptures, it is clear that when you agree to come into covenant with Yahuwah, you become Yahuwah's treasured possession a chosen race, a kingdom of priests, a set-apart nation and people, both kings and priests, living stones built up to offer spiritual slaughter offerings or sacrifices acceptable to Yahuwah through Yahusha. Psalm 19, the verses 7, 8, and 9. The Torah of Yahuwah is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of Yahuwah are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahuwah are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of Yahuwah are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of Yahuwah are sure and altogether righteous. Pursue set apart lies, and that's very important. We read in 1 Peter 2 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set apart nation, a people for possession, that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yahuwah, whenever I'm afraid, I will trust you. Psalms 56 verse 3. Question number three, what are spiritual slaughter offerings or sacrifices that are acceptable to Yahuwah? Number one, surrendering our will to Yahuwah by obeying his covenant. In Luke 22:42, it says, yet not my will, but let yours be done. Number two, to remain strong in the faith, even though, even through persecution. And after you have suffered a little while, the Elohim of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Yahusha, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10 Number 3. Spiritual sacrifices replace the animal sacrifices and Aaronic priesthood of the Book of the Law. We are a kingdom of priests under the order of Melchizedek, with Yahusha as our 
Melchizedek High Priest. Number four, prayer is a spiritual sacrifice. May my prayer be set before you like incense. See Psalm 141.2 We are to pray without ceasing, believing that Yahuwah hears our prayers. Thessalonians 5, 17-19 Spiritual sacrifices is living as an example to others by showing love, kindness, patience, and crucifying our flesh by getting rid of our pride, stubbornness, and all the things that are not pleasing to Yahuwah. Galatians 5, 19-21 and the works of the flesh are well known, which are these adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency, idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, quarrels, jealousies, fits of rage, meaning anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, like disputes, factions, envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, that those who practice such as these shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. So let everything that has breath praise Yahuwah, Psalm 150, verse 6. Yahuwah ascribed to Yahuwah the esteem of his name. Bow yourself to Yahuwah in the splendor of set-apartness. Psalm 29, verse 2. Question number 4. What happens if we choose to ignore all the commandments, statutes, and judgments that are written in the everlasting covenant? We read in Romans 2, 5 to 8, But according to your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim, who shall render to each one according to his works. Everlasting life to those who by persistence in good work, obedience, seek for esteem and respect, and incorruptibility, but wrath and displeasure to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Spiritual maturity isn't measured by how high you jump in praise, but how straight you walk in obedience. If you have life, it is from Yahuwah. If you have light, it is from Yahuwah. If you have sight, it is from Yahuwah. If you have understanding, it is from Yahuwah. If you have repentance, it is from Yahuwah. If you have faith to embrace Mashiach, it is from Yahuwah. It is the work of Yahuwah. Yahuwah alone can give light and life. Yahuwah alone can regenerate. And it is the power of Yahuwah alone that brings salvation to the sinner. Punishment for disobedience and ignoring the covenant of Yahuwah. In Leviticus uh, 26, 14 to 17, it says, But if you do not obey me, and do not do all these commands, and if you reject my covenant, my laws, or if you are being loathed by my right rulings, so that you do not do all my commands, but break my covenant. I also do this to you. 
and I shall appoint sudden alarm over you, wasting disease and inflammation, destroying the eyes, and consuming the life. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I shall set my face against you, and you shall be smitten before your enemies. And those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. Please read all of Leviticus 26:14 to 26 to see how Yahuwah will punish you for disobedience when you choose to ignore His covenant. This is very, very serious. Remember, walk in His ways. Keep His statutes. Keep His commandments. Keep His ordinances. Keep His testimonies. 1 Kings 2, 3. In Deuteronomy 5.29, I love this uh, verse, where it says, Oh, that there was such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Question number five. Are the Ten Commandments the only law? found in the blood covenant of Yahuwah? The answer is no. All the everlasting commandments, statutes, and judgments are found in the blood covenant which was sealed with Yahusha's blood. Therefore, we cannot remove any laws from Yahuwah's covenant. Let's look at Deuteronomy 27.10 in the World English Bible. You shall therefore obey the voice of Yahuwah, or Yahweh, they say, your Elohim, and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day. Question number six. How many times did Moses go up and down the mountain to get all the covenant laws from Yahuwah? Moses had ten encounters at Mount Sinai. Eight of them were up and down the mountain. Two encounters were, number one, at the burning bush. Number two, when Moses moved the tent of meeting outside the camp in Exodus. Request full study on this topic. Three of the ten encounters were connected to Yahuwah's laws. Here we have script number five in Exodus 20, 21. Moses receives the judgments for the rest of the book of the covenant laws after the ten commandments were spoken. Trip number six, Exodus 24, 9 to 18. Moses at the top of Mount Sinai, he was there forty days and forty nights, received the commandments, engraved upon the tables of stone, including the judgment, in Exodus 21-23. See Exodus 34-15. Trip number 10, Exodus 34-4. Moses returns to the top of Mount Sinai to have received the second set of tablets on stone to replace the broken set. Here we have some uh, pictures that uh, people try to portray what it looked like. Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and on the right side, when they saw the uh, lightnings, the fire, and the thundering. Question number seven. Who was chosen as mediator of Yah's people in the wilderness as the people did not want to allow Yahuwah to continue speaking to them directly? 
We read in Exodus 3.10, And now, come, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Mitzrayim, Egypt. Moses was chosen by Yahuwah as mediator between Israel and Yah in the role of the last earthly order of the Melchizedek priest unto the Messiah. Moses told the people Israel in Deuteronomy 18.15, Yahuwah Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brothers. Listen to him. This is referring to Yahusha, who is our eternal Melchizedek High Priest. Question number eight. What are the four requirements to seal covenant between Yahuwah and his people? The four requirements to seal the book of the covenant between Yah and his people, Israel, are as follows. Number one is a proposal from Yahuwah. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. Number two, we have the acceptance by the people. In Exodus 19.8, all the words which Yah has said we will do. Now this is what the people answered. There were two more acceptances in Exodus 24.5 and verse 7. Number three, we need blood ratification of the Book of the Covenant and of the people. Hebrews 9, 19-22 And then Exodus 24, 8 And Moshe, Moses, took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See, the blood of the covenant which Yahuwah has made with you concerning all these words. And number four sealed with a covenant-confirming meal. The covenant meal was eaten by the 75 leaders of Israel in the presence of Yahuwah as a final act of ratification that nothing shall be added or taken away from these covenant words. Exodus 24, 9-11 And Moshe went up, all the Aaron, Nadab, and Abihai, and seventy of the elders. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, and under his feet like a paved work of sapphire stone, and like the heavens for brightness. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Israel. And they saw Elohim, and they ate and drank. All four requirements for the Book of the Covenant were definitely made with Israel. This covenant was all the, for the great multitude that came out of Egypt. The same principle applies today. Upon acceptance of the everlasting covenant, anyone can be grafted in or adopted at any time. Question number nine. Who spoke the first part of the covenant to the people of Israel? The Ten Commandments as first part of the covenant was spoken by Yahuwah from Mount Sinai. He was just getting started. Not done yet. But the people were fearful. They were afraid of the voice of Yahuwah and backed away from the mountain. 
We read in Exodus 20, 18 to 21, and all the people saw the thunders, the lightning flashes, the sound of the ram's horn, and the mountain smoking. And the people saw it, and they trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moshe, You speak with us, and we hear, but let not Elohim speak with us, lest we die. And Moshe said to the people, Do not fear, for Elohim has come to prove you, and in order that his fear be before you, so that you do not sin. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe drew near the thick darkness where Elohim was. So Moses went back up the mountain to get the rest of the statutes and judgments, which are part of the covenant. Yahuwah then said to Moses, But as for thee, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments, which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess. Deuteronomy 5.31 These scriptures show us clearly that the statutes and judgments were all part of the covenant not just the Ten Commandments. Question number 10. What are the laws that are part of the covenant did Moses receive on his fifth trip up to Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai, trip number 5 in Exodus 2021. 20, Moses to receive second part of the covenant listed in Exodus 20, 22 to Exodus 23, 33. The words of this covenant are about 3,000 words, laws to govern a whole nation for all time. While he's up there, he receives the rest of the words of Yah, as noted in the list below. The remaining laws of the covenant are recorded in 105 verses from Exodus 20:22 20, to Exodus 23:33. Number one, the law of the altar, specifically not to make any molten idols of silver or gold. Number two, the law concerning servants, those that had a debt to pay off, Exodus 21.1, 1, 2, verse 32. Number three, laws of restitution, restoration of something lost or stolen to its proper owner, violence and animal control and responsibility for property. See Exodus 21.33 to uh, 22.15. And number four, moral and ceremonial principles. That is in Exodus 22, 16 to 31. Note Exodus 22, 20. Worship no other gods on penalty of death. This command is listed five to six times in this everlasting covenant. Number five, laws about social justice for all. In Exodus 23, one to nine, note again, no mention of other gods upon your lips. Exodus 23, 13, and in all that I have said to you, take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones. Let it not be heard from your mouth. Number six, the law of the sabbatical years, Exodus 23, 10 to 11, and the weekly Sabbath, verse 12. Number seven, laws about the Sabbath and festivals of Yahuwah. See Exodus 23, 10 to 23, 19. Question 11. What feast dates are mentioned in the blood ratified covenant? 
all of uh, Yahuwah's feast days are in the blood ratified covenant and cannot be removed, period. They are forever and teach us the plan of salvation. If we ignore Yahuwah's feast days, we are breaking his covenant. Exodus 23, 14-19 Three times in the year you are to observe a festival to me. The festivals of Yahuwah are grouped in three for three different times of the year. Exodus 23, 15 guards the festival of unleavened bread. Seven days you eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt and do not appear before me empty-handed. Exodus 23:16 And the festival of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you have sown in the field, and the festival of the ingathering, the feast of tabernacles at the outgoing of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Exodus 23:17 Three times in the year all your males are to appear before the master Yahuwah. Verse 18, do not offer the blood of my slaughtering with leavened bread, and the fat of my offering shall not remain until the morning. Verse 19, bring the first of the first fruits of your land into the house of Yahuwah, your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Question number 12. Is the covenant of Yahuwah all the part of following the correct calendar at the correct times and days? Yes, absolutely. Yahuwah's covenant calendar is part of the everlasting covenant. Therefore, we need to keep it on the correct times and days. As he is saying in Deuteronomy 5.33, And you shall guard to do as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in all the way which Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that you live, and it be well with you, and you shall prolong your days in the land which you possess. The covenant calendar is part of the blood ratified covenant and is found completely between the pages of Genesis 1 1 to Exodus 24 11 and stands in complete alignment with Yahushua HaMashiach's everlasting blood ratified book of the covenant under the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood. The requirements for the six calendar components are all the found between Genesis 1-1 to Exodus 24-11. These are discussed next. Yahuwah has a blood ratified covenant with the day and the night. This is what Yahuwah says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer come under their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant and with my ministers, the Levites, who are priests, so that David will not have a son to reign on his throne. Jeremiah 33.20 If you begin your day at sunset, then you are breaking the blood covenant of Yahuwah as creation began with light, and we are children of the light, not of darkness. Question number 13. When is the day start of the covenant calendar? Day start. Genesis 1 3. And Elohim said, Let light come to be. And light came to be. Genesis 1 5. And Elohim called the light day. And the darkness he called night. 
And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning, the first day. Every day begins with the first light in the dawn sky, called twilight. Everything on day one of creation began with light. And do remember there was no sunrise or sunset under the first day of creation. Remember today, while the sunrise may follow shortly after the dawn daybreak, the day does not begin with sunrise, but with light. Question number 14. How many hours in a biblical day? Day length. It is a conviction of lifeline to Yahusha Ministries, not of the presenter, that every day of creation, including the weekly Shabbat, has a full 24 hours, including morning twilight, the daylight season, the evening twilight, and then the night season. In this order, Yahusha said in John 11:9, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. There is all the 12 hours of night. They conclude that every Sabbath, whether weekly or an annual Sabbath, has a commanded full 24 hours, day and night, for rest. Worship, praise, prayer, fellowship, and feasting. It is their conclusion that the Shabbat, the set-apart hours, the holy hours, begin at dawn, twilight, and ends at dawn, twilight, on what the Roman calendar calls Sunday. Yahuwah's calendar is not a Roman calendar that begins any day at midnight. It simply is Shabbat until the next dawn begins to illuminate the sky with light. Then the day, the 24-hour cycle, turns to the first cycle of the week, Matthew 28, 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward dawn on the first day of the week. Question number 15. How do you calculate the start of the biblical year? Year start. The following is for the Northern Hemisphere explanation. The southern folk will make the necessary adjustments. When the sun finishes its circuit in the heavens after a year of travel through the twelve constellations and changes the winter season to the spring season, this equinox event is what determines the end of the old year and the start of the new year on the next day. Psalm 19, 1 to 6, the heavens are proclaiming the esteem of El, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, and there is no words. The voice is not heard. The line has gone out to all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them, he set up a tent for the sun, and it is like a bridegroom coming out of his room. It rejoices like a strong man to run the path. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and it circled the Dekufa to the other end, and naught is hidden from its heat. Circuit is a circular line, a route or movement that starts and finishes at the same place. Question, how to find the equinox? Measure the angle of rise or fall of the path. 
The day on which this angle is the same in the forenoon and afternoon is the day of the equinox. This fixes the date of the equinox even if the blackboard is not due east and west since it fixes the date on which the path is a straight line. Spring equinox in the northern hemisphere. The March equinox, also known as spring equinox or vernal equinox, occurs when the sun crosses the equator line from south to north. In the northern hemisphere, the vernal equinox falls about March 20 or 21, as the sun crosses the celestial equator going north. In the southern hemisphere, the equinox occurs on September 22 or 23, when the sun moves south across the celestial equator. In the northern hemisphere, the day after the equinox is always listed as the first day of spring, and the rightly so. This is the time of the greening, or a beep, when the land comes back to life. This month is the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of the year for you, according to Exodus 12.2. It's noticeably clear the start of the year and the beginning of the first month were when the crops were in a beep. And we know from the plagues the barley had just been destroyed while in the head. This is the springtime in the northern hemisphere. Note, the year starts is not determined by looking at the sun, but by a combination of four components that are needed to produce an equinox, namely, number one, the Maserat, the 12 constellations, number two, the sun circuit, ending at the same place each year in the Maserat, Number three, light is needed to cast a shadow. And number four, the earth is needed to receive the light and the shadows. Autumn or September equinox. The equinox occurs precisely when the sun's center passes through this line. When the sun crosses the equator from north to south, this marks the autumnal equinox. When it crosses from south to north, this marks the vernal equinox. Question number 16. How many days in a biblical year? Let's look at it, the year length. For the first 3,300 years from creation, Yahuwah's year was composed of 360 days, and that was all. From the flood account in Genesis 7 and 8, five months were equal to 150 days. The flood occurred approximately 2000 BC, following the footsteps of Moses from Egypt to Mount Sinai around 1500 BC. The calendar still had 30 days, months from Passover in the first month to the quail manna in the second month to Pentecost and giving of the everlasting book of the covenant laws in the third month. The three and a half years are three and a half biblical years of 360 days and the 42 months are 42 biblical months of 30 days. All seven verses are speaking of 1,260 days. Question number 17. When did the Earth's year length change to 365 days? The Earth's year's length they change with a huge shift at Hezekiah's sundial miracle, according to Isaiah 38. 
where Hezekiah asked Yahuwah to make the sun go backwards, which added five plus days to the 360 days of the creation year. However, this does not change the length of Yahuwah's festival calendar. It is still 360 days, and that is all. Inevitably, until he changes the earth's year length back to 360 days, the extra waiting days from account 361 to 365, 366 are exactly that. They are days that are waited out, waiting for the equinox, sign or shadow, on the ground to determine the day of the turning of the year has arrived, just as the great pyramids with Joseph in Egypt still determine today. Acts 7.22, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and works. Moses knew when the year's start was, and he knew the equinox calculation of those pyramids was also in alignment with Yahuwah's instructions for the year's start. It all started with Joseph being sent to Egypt, where a lot of calendar truths were preserved for his people over the prophetic time frame of 400 years from Abraham to the departure from Egypt. Do this interesting math. 360 days a year times 400 years equals 1,000 or 144,000 days, days from Abraham to Moses, deliverance of Yah's people from Egypt. Isn't that amazing? Question, year start. The following is for the Northern Hemisphere explanation. The Southern folk will make the necessary adjustment. When the sun finishes its circles in the heavens after a year of travel and changes the winter season to the spring season, this equinox event is what determines the end of the old year and the start of the new year, the very next day. Psalm 19, 1 to 6. Question, why is it called equinox? On the days of the equinoxes, the Earth axis is perpendicular to the sun rays, meaning that all regions on Earth receive about the same number of hours of sunlight. In other words, night and day are, in principle, close to the same length all over the world. In the Northern Hemisphere, the day after the equinox is always listed as the first day of spring, and rightly so. This is the time of the greening, or a beep, when the land comes back to life. How long is a year? The Bible supports a 360-day year in Genesis, Daniel, and Revelation. Although the flood, five months equals 150 days. 30 days months equals 360 days a year. Question number 18. How do you work out when the biblical month starts? Month start. Covenant calendar does not use any of the moon cycles to determine the first day of any month. Gazing at the sun or the moon for the purpose of setting time frames of any worship statues is strictly forbidden by Moses in two very clear commands and found in Deuteronomy 4.19. And lest you lift up your eyes to the heavens, and shall see the sun, and the moon, and the stars, all the hosts of the heavens, and you be drawn away into bowing down to them, and serving them, which Yahuwah Yahuwah has allotted to all the people 
on the all the heavens. Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 5 says, When there is found in your midst, in any of your cities, which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, your Elohim, in transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other mighty ones and bowed down to them, or to the sun, or to the moon, or to any of the hosts of the heavens, which I have not commanded, and it has been made known to you, and you have heard and have searched diligently, then see if true, the matter is confirmed that such an abomination has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out your gates that man or woman who has done this evil matter and you shall stone to death that man or woman with stones gazing at the sun and moon is an abomination to yahuwah and for disobedience the penalty was death by stoning the moon is not given for worship commands but for ordinances to bless the earth and mankind with bountiful blessings of harvest. Deuteronomy 33.14 With the choice fruits of the sun, with the choice yield of the months. Do note in Jeremiah 31.35 Thus said Yahuwah Elohim, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the laws, the ordinances of the moon, and the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea, and its waves roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. The biblical year, the month of the year, in Exodus 12. Month of the year, this month shall be unto you the beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Exodus 12, 2. The time of the tenth plague of Egypt was in the spring around the month of March, April. The religious year started around that time. A beep means barley is ripe. The light of the sun rules the day. The constant light of the stars rule the night. And the moon is given for ordinances. As an example of one of these ordinances, the tides of the sea is mentioned. The moon is never the ruler of the night, being found in the day sky more than half of every month. The moon is simply incapable of fulfilling Yahuwah's command to divide the day from the night. In Genesis 1.14, and Elohim said, Let lights come to be in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and years. Because the moon has a prevalent lunar presence during the light of the day season, it is easy to see the moon has no authority over the division of night and day. Neither does the moon have any divine authority to commence the festival month or the weekly annual Sabbaths as was practiced by many pagans over thousands of years. Jeremiah 31.35 Thus says Yahuwah, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. Question number 19. How many days in a biblical month? 
Okay, let's look at the month's length. As already mentioned, Yahuwah's month consists of 30 days each. Genesis 7, 8, five months had 150 days. There are 12 months in the year. We find provision by wise King Solomon for his court by designating certain officers to be in charge for one month of every year. He made provisions for only 12 months in a year. Never was there provision for 13 months. See First Chronicles 27, 1 to 15. The number 12 can be found in 187 places in the scriptures. Revelation alone has 22 occurrences of this number, one extremely important example being the tree of life, Revelation 22.2, bearing 12 fruits, one every month. The meaning of 12, which is considered a perfect number, symbolizes Yahuwah's power and authority, as well as serving as a perfect governmental foundation. The number 13 never has a place in naming anything in Yahuwah's covenant calendar. The New Jerusalem has 12 gates, named after the 12 tribes of Israel. Question number 20. What do we look to for Yahuwah's covenant calendar if we do not look to the sun or to the moon? Yahuwah's covenant calendar is simply designed by looking to the light and learning to count. It is a covenant count. All he asks is that we look to the light to begin the day. Watch for the equinox shadow to know when to commence the year and then learn to count. 1 to 30 for each month. 1 to 12 for 12 months of the year. Or 1 to 360 counting each day in his calendar because he knows the end from the beginning, according to Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, and promises that we too can know the end from the beginning. He has shown by many timeline prophecies in Revelation that his calendar will be reinstated before the end of time. 1260 days in Revelation 11, 12 and 13 is equal to 42 months of 30 days each. In Scripture, there is no provision for any year in those three and a half years to have an additional 13th month. These timelines are specifically given for the bride to know how to walk out her steps in the last days of an urgent message to the world to repent before it is too late. If you are following the wrong calendar, you will miss the wedding date as the bride of Yahuwah, of Yahusha. If you miss that date, you will lose your salvation. What an incredible sign from our master of the covenant calendar to provide for his bride and his people Everywhere that when our current year goes back to the way it was in the beginning, back to only 360 days per year, a huge sign to his people that indeed he is still in control. Question number 21. What happened to the city of Jericho? who worshipped the lunar base calendar, which added a 13 month. There is, however, one brilliant instance when the number 13 provides a very strong example for calendar considerations. It was upon the 13th March, around the central center of moon worship, Jericho, that Yahuwah felt the walls, the foundation of the city and its lunar based system of worship. The chosen people of Yahuwah then walked into the city with a lunar foundation for worship 
under the feet as seen prophetically in Revelation 12.1. Bethula, Yahuwah's chosen bride, seen with the moon, lunar-based worship under her feet. Ephesians 1.12 or 122, I'm sorry. And he, Yahuwah, put all things in subjection under his, Yahusha's feet, and gave him as head over all things to the assembly. Matthew 22:44. Yahuwah said to my master, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Under her feet, therefore, shows that the bride of Yahusha will not follow lunar moon calendars, which are all pagan worship and an abomination to Yahuwah. Question number 22. What is the best part about Yahuwah's covenant calendar? The best part about Yahuwah's covenant calendar Everything that has been lightly explained here about the six different components included in any, every calendar is this. All six of these components with accurate description and instructions for fulfillment are found within the pages between Genesis 1.1 to Exodus 24.11. Imagine that. The basic foundation of the covenant of the whole covenant calendar is found in these few pages. But even more exciting is this from Genesis 1 1 to Exodus 24 11, it's exactly where Yahuwah's blood ratified everlasting book of the covenant is found. The words of this book are found in the four chapters of Exodus 20 to 23 in Exodus 24, 1 to 11. Is where you find these words are blood ratified, not to be changed, added to, or subtracted from. Question number 23. What was written on the two tablets of stone by Yahuwah? This blood ratified book of the covenant was taken by Moses to the top of Mount Sinai, and Yahuwah himself engraved these words. See Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23, the covenant commands, unto the two tables of stone, front and back, Exodus 32, 15, and 16, and Moshe turned and went down from the mountain and in his hand were the two tablets of the witness tablets written on both their sides written on the one and on the other and the tablets were the work of Elohim and the writings were the writing of Elohim engraved on the tablets these are the words that still stand today period they are the perfect instructions from our highest Melchizedek priest, re-established and ratified by his blood at Calvary. Question number 24. Is the Old Covenant commandment, statutes, and judgment the same in the New Covenant? Yahusha is the same yesterday, today and forever, according to Hebrews 13.8. He said in Psalm 89.34, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Question number 25. Who broke Yahuwah's covenant? It was Israel that broke Yahuwah's covenant at the golden calf breach. Deuteronomy 29, 25, because they, Israel, 
for took the covenant of Yahuwah the Elohim of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Hebrews 8, 7 to 10. Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, said Yahuwah, because this is a covenant that I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah, giving my laws in their mind, and I shall write them on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Isaiah 24, 5, The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Question number 26. What is the difference between the Old and the New Covenant? The same commandments, statutes, and judgments are in both the Old and the New Covenant. Yahusha is a mediator and Melchizedek, high priest of the New Covenant, which is able to take away the sins of the world by his precious blood when he died on the tree for us. The Aaronic priesthood, temple and animal sacrifices are no longer needed as it was there to be a schoolmaster to Israel till Messiah comes. Hebrews 8, 6, But now he, Yahusha, has obtained a more excellent service, inasmuch as he is all the mediator of a better covenant, which was constituted on better promises. Hebrews 7, 1 and 12 Truly then, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under the, it the people were given the Torah, why was there so need for another priest? To arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law, like the temple, Aaronic priesthood and animal sacrifices done away. Also, the better promises are from the new covenant compared to the book of the law that could not save you. The only difference between the old and the new covenant is the date. Just like a will has a date, an 1892 will might be rewritten with identical con contents in 1922, but it is still a new will because of the date. Also note that with the new covenant, it also is blood ratified with Yahusha's blood, the better blood than that of sacrificed animals. Question number 27. Why is it important to partake of the new covenant, Passover, and what does it represent? Yahusha, our bridegroom, has made an offer of betrothal to us to be his bride. He has given her the covenant promises, and he is now waiting for the bride to accept or not to accept his be total offer. When we do not celebrate the Passover, we reject the Passover betrothal of Yahusha. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, according to Hebrews 9.22. This is my blood, he says, of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Question number 28. According to scripture, how does the prospective bride accept the bridegroom's offer? 
the bride's acceptance of the bridegroom's offer of betrothal is to be made by drinking of the same covenant cup from which the bridegroom drank, both literally and figuratively. Let us look at the scriptures to see what this covenant cup is. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner all the he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, meaning at Passover, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Master's death till he comes. The First Corinthians 11, 23-26 Question number 29. What does foot washing at Passover represent? Yahushua humbled himself when he washed the feet of the disciples, and we are to follow his example. Humbling ourselves to be a servant for Yahushua is what foot washing represents. Anyone who wants to be a true believer must humble themselves and serve others in humility. Matthew 23, 1 and 12 But the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. We are his people. And we are also now in the tabernacle of this fleshly body, the dwelling place of Yahuwah. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Thus we are required to be sprinkled by the physical blood of the covenant, by that which represents Messiah's blood. This covenant sprinkling is done when we participate in the body, meaning the bread, and the blood, meaning the grape juice, of the Passover meal. It requires us to be in covenant with Yahusha, agreeing and doing all his commandments, statutes and judgment. This includes keeping the seventh day Sabbath, and Yahuwah's feast days, as well as eating only clean food, according to the dietary laws in Leviticus 11. We cannot partake of the new covenant, betrothal, meal, if we are not obeying his terms and condition for his bride, the covenant Torah. Question number 30, in closing, what does his blood have to do with covenant calendars? Well, first, the covenant calendar is found between those precious pages of Genesis 1-1 to Exodus 24-11, where for 2,500 years, the patriarchs and prophets lift out these covenant instructions, of which calendar was a huge part for the weekly and annual worship statutes. This covenant calendar is all the blood ratified by the precious blood of our Savior Yahusha on his Passover day. Yahusha died on the Passover day of his covenant calendar. You see, if Yahusha dies on any other calendar, he is automatically disqualified as a true Messiah. These are a few of the highlights of Covenant Calendar that makes it divinely unique, special, simple, and elegant, so simple that children can actually calculate this calendar when they know how to count. The key to the knowledge and understanding of Yahuwah's true calendar has begun, has again been found. With just one divine swipe, the covenant calendar can detect any counterfeit calendar that lingers to have dominance. Of utmost importance, covenant calendar upholds, reestablishes, supports, fulfills, and exonerates each statute written in the scriptures 
without exception. This statement is proven time and time again with each examination of the many different facets of calendar examples from the scriptures. This very fact is one that separates this blood ratified calendar from any, every other counterfeit calendar known to men. Choose you this day who you will serve, which calendar will be in alignment with the Creator's design from the first day of creation, and all the lift out in his life through the four Gospels with a final, determined, and sure witness in his death, burial, resurrection, and two ascensions. That, my friend, will be the true calendar with blessings galore. Here's an appeal. Each one has a choice to compare this covenant calendar to any other calendar to see if indeed it is a true blood ratified covenant calendar. May each one interested in finding the true covenant calendar of Yahuwah take on this challenge in wonder and joy, seeking the blessing that lay in wait. Study notes taken from Covenant Calendar Club and for more detailed studies, please visit www.studythecalendar.com. The ultimate provider is Yahushua HaMashiach. This presentation originated from Lifeline to Yahushua Ministries. It was arranged, modified, and recorded by myself. You can reach me at Malachi4, D-O-T-4, at gmail.com. You can uh, ask for more Bible studies when you go to Lifeline to Yahusha Ministries at that address. So if you want to get a hold of me or go to my website, it's the thefigtreegeneration.net or thefigtreegeneration.com. And if you agree with this message, please give us a thumb up. Shalom.